Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's Aspen Colloquium speaker, Professor Elliot Quattert. So Elliot did his undergraduate degree at MIT, his PhD at Harvard, he started a five-year position at the IAS, which is apparently a complete waste because within two years he moved to Berkeley as a faculty member, um, then spent almost 20 years at Berkeley for fairly recently moving to Princeton, of where he is now a professor. Um, Elliot, of course, has a very large number of awards, ranging from the Packard Fellowship, Diamond Investigator Fellowship, membership of several different academies of science, um, and also, as you will get to hear in a moment, his talk, a number of prizes for excellence in undergraduate teaching and outreach. So I think you're in for a treat. I should also say that despite all of these amazing accomplishments, the one that I'm still most impressed by is, of course, Elliot's skill at ping pong, where he is absolutely undefeatable. And so while I have no hope of ever uh, competing with Elliot in astrophysics, I still relish the prospect that one day, one day, Elliot, I'll at least be able to score a few points off of you. <laughs> now, without further ado, I'm turning this over to Elliot. Thank you, Ilya. Thank you. Many fun evenings at KITP. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here today and tell you a little bit about some of the work we've been doing on trying to understand um, plasma near the event horizon of black holes and how that shows up observationally and what we can learn from observations, uh, really amazing observational breakthroughs like uh, was produced by the Event Horizon Telescope. I should say from the start that I'm not a member of the Event Horizon Telescope team or any of the observational teams that I'll be featuring the results of. Instead, I do the theoretical work and, and try to interpret and make predictions relevant for that. I should say I'm here not as one of the workshops, but rather with one of the small collaboration groups. So there's four of us here, Michael Johnson, Charles Gammy, Alex Lupsaska, all of whom are, are working on related things to uh, understanding black holes and how to tackle this observationally. Michael's the project scientist for Next Generation Event Horizon Telescope and Charles and Alex are, are also theorists working on uh, understanding the near horizon environment and what kind of observational signals that produces. So please, as I go, I'm gonna, I'm gearing this talk not to the astronomers. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, especially the non-astronomers as we go, uh, feel free to ask. I'll try to avoid too much jargon, but if I slip into that, uh, interrupt me and ask. So the, the subject of today's talk is black holes as classical objects. So we're solely and completely within the realm of general relativity today. And in that context, uh, one of the, Eight theorems of general relativity is that uh, black holes are uniquely described by just a few basic properties. In practice, for astrophysics, that turns out to be the mass and the spin of the black hole. And I think equally surprisingly, that despite the uh, sort of definition of black holes uh, as objects from which nothing can escape, um, one of the great predictions, again, of classical general relativity is that you can actually extract some of the energy of the black hole and dump it into the surrounding environment. And in particular, that's the energy associated with the rotation of the black hole. This was uh, first realized by Penrose and Floyd in an example involving particles, individual particles near the event horizon. And it was later uh, expanded to what we think is the more astrophysically a relevant version of the idea, which is that magnetic fields supported by plasma outside the horizon, uh, those magnetic fields, if they thread through the horizon, they can extract the rotational energy of the black hole uh, and send it out into the environment in the form of a pointing flux. And I'll come back to some ideas that we've had recently on how one can observationally test that prediction um, using uh, observations close to the event horizon of black holes. The primary lens through which we're going to view black holes today is the process of accretion. 
So gas or ionized plasma flowing in towards a central object, a black hole in our case, uh, and the energy released as gas flows into the central object is the gravitational potential energy difference between being far away and being near the surface of the object. And you can generally express this as a rate of releasing energy in some fraction of m dot c squared, the rest mass energy of the material that's falling onto the central object. And the Newtonian calculation says that this efficiency is just set by the ratio of the escape speed to the speed of light for the object that you're falling onto. This efficiency is very small for uh, a star like the sun, whose gravitational potential is not very deep. But it's, of course, maximized for black holes and neutron stars, the smallest objects for their masses. And the efficiency, the fraction of the rest mass energy that you get out uh, in the form of energy as gas falls onto a black hole is in the realm of 10 or 20 percent. This is the Newtonian derivation you can do of course, a general relativistic derivation where it depends on the spin, but it can be a large fraction of the rest mass energy of the inflowing gas. And this energy source is in addition to, separate from uh, the energy stored in the rotation of the black hole. The idea of gas falling onto black holes accretion as an important energy source in astrophysics was really came to the fore in the mid-1960s with the discovery that quasars, these very, very bright sources of light on the sky, were incredibly distant. And so they were actually regions no longer than our solar system producing more light than trillions of stars in a galaxy. And very soon after that observational discovery by Martin Schmidt, uh, Ed Sulpeter and Zeldovich proposed that the power source for these objects was gas falling into a black hole. And this is, I think, a beautiful example where if you just look with the Hubble Space Telescope, you see a point source of light. And you have to do very, 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 very careful image subtraction to remove the point source of light, which is the accretion flow onto the black hole, and see that that black hole is actually sitting in a galaxy that has trillions of stars. That's just how bright this process is. In general, in yeah, the question was the trillions of stars are the faint fuzz you see when you subtract the point source of light away. The point source is the region near the horizon of the black hole producing this incredibly bright source of light. This is the trillions of stars. In general, there are two fates for uh, energy liberated falling onto a black hole. This is actually where black holes are different from other astronomical objects. Because in the case of a black hole, some of the energy released by accretion in principle can go through the event horizon and just disappear. While if you're accreting onto a neutron star or a star, the only energy channels available for all this energy released by accretion are that the energy can be either radiated away or it can be lost in the form of kinetic energy of outflows or electromagnetic energy flux of outflow. And we think which of these regimes are the most important is the dominant energy loss, the stuff going through the horizon, or is the dominant energy loss, energies radiated away and carried away in the form of outflows, uh, basically depends on how quickly gas that's falling towards the central object can cool, can radiate away its thermal energy relative to how long it takes the material to fall towards the central object. So if the cooling time is very short compared to the time it takes stuff to flow inwards, then you radiate away all this energy that's released very quickly. And this is sort of the, the case that produces very thin disks, like a galactic disk seen here, or the disk of our solar system out of which the planets form. Those disks are in this regime, rapid cooling. On the other hand, if the time scale for the gas to radiate away its energy is long compared to the inflow time, uh, then the energy that's released goes into heat, but then ultimately goes either into outflows or through the horizon, and you generally end up with a geometrically thicker, puffier structure. 
Uh, and this distinction uh, will, will come back and be important a little later. So I highlighted outflows as one way of liberating the energy associated with gas falling onto a central object. And indeed, black holes at the centers of galaxies uh, produce these astonishing outflows that we call relativistic jets. Relativistic, the gas is moving uh, with Lorentz factors of tens. Uh, and jets, because the energy comes out in this linear collimated form. So what you're seeing here are observations of a galaxy here. The galaxy is a small region here that you can't actually see. This is a radio image. This is an optical image like what our eye can see. Uh, and what we think is happening is that very close to the black hole, energy is being channeled into this collimated outflow. That outflow travels millions of light years out of the galaxy away from the black hole. And ultimately, the energy in that outflow dissipates into the surrounding medium. And that produces these sort of bubbles or lobes of radiation that you see when the energy originally produced very close to the black hole is ultimately radiated away. And there are two ideas for what is the dominant energy source powering these outflows. One is that it's the rotational energy of the black hole. And the other is that it's energy liberated by accretion onto the black hole at the center of the galaxy. And one of the things we'd like to understand is uh, which of these models is actually the correct model. Why does it cause a jet instead of doing something else? Right. So the question is, why does it cause a jet instead of a slightly more spherical outflow that covers a broader range of solid angles? And I think the answer to that is that uh, it does also produce a broader outflow that covers a, a wider range of solid angles. That doesn't get as far away from the black hole because there's a lot more stuff that it can run into. And the particular component that you see here is the component of the outflow that is sort of channeled by magnetic fields along probably the rotation axis of the black hole. <clears throat> That's right. So these outflows, the question is, are these outflows produced by all black holes, just ones at the center of galaxies? And the answer is produced, we think, by, by all black holes. So we see examples of this uh, from black holes in our galaxy that are accreting gas from a binary companion, and they produce similar jets and they produce similar bubbles, they're just not as energetic and they don't go as far. So they're not as dramatic as these examples. Just out of curiosity, does this jet have angular momentum? So the, the jet does most certainly carry away an angular momentum flux from the central region. And that angular momentum flux is again, sort of either the spin energy of the black hole or some of the angular momentum that was in the rotation of the gas that's falling into the black hole. Of course, as you move further away, that rotation becomes less important and the motion becomes dominated by the, the outward velocity. Question. Okay, so the, what has made this an incredibly exciting area to work on and think about in the last five, six, seven years is really a new observational breakthrough, a new set of observational tools that have allowed us to see even closer to the event horizon of black hole. And that observational tool is the tool of high angular resolution, namely the ability to take images that have very fine detail you can see what's going on closer and closer to the event horizon of black hole. And there's two sort of independent avenues on which this has been happening. One is in the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, in which the four very large telescopes run by the European Southern Observatory, each of these telescopes has a diameter of eight meters. And the light from all of these telescopes is coherently combined via an interferometer uh, to create higher resolution images than either telescope can produce on its own. This is the gravity interferometer. 
And then the same basic technique, interferometry, can be used uh, at other wavelengths. In fact, it's primarily used at radio wavelengths. So it was a real breakthrough to be able to get this to work in the infrared. And the Event Horizon Telescope uh, is a slight misnomer because it's not one telescope, right? It's a collection of telescopes across the Earth where you're combining the radio waves detected on all these different sites using that information to synthesize an image that has the angular resolution corresponding to the distance between the telescopes. And so I'm a theorist. I'm not involved in any of these collaborations. Um, but I think it's you know, important to stress that it really is the observational developments enabled by these projects that have made this such an incredibly exciting area. Uh, and so I think this is really kudos to those teams for the incredible amount of hard work that it took to actually uh, do these experiments. So again, this is the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and this is in the radio, the millimeter part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And this is a very hard experiment. The event horizon of black holes are actually quite small. And it turns out that at least right now, there are two sources we can see on the sky where we can see structure on a spatial scale comparable to the event horizon of the black hole. One of those is the center of our galaxy, which has a black hole with a mass of about 4 million solar masses. This is the biggest uh, massive black hole, that, sorry, the closest massive black hole that we know of, about 27,000 light years away. And then, coincidentally, there's another galaxy it's called M87, Messier 87. This is the one whose image I already showed you. So here's the galaxy. Here's the jet from that black hole, we think. That galaxy is about 2,000 times further away, but its black hole has a mass of about 1,500 times that of the one in the center of our galaxy. So the angular size of the horizon, which is mass divided by distance, is actually very similar in these two cases. And that angle, just to give you a sense, it's about a billionth of a degree. So what these experiments have done is they've tried to see what's going on near the event horizon of a black hole by taking images with an angular resolution of about a billionth of a degree, which is equivalent to taking a, a picture of a tennis ball or an orange uh, on the moon restricting yourself to staying on Earth, not cheating and going to the moon. So that's a really, really difficult experiment. And as the observations get better, we'll be able to see more systems. So right now we're restricted to these two examples, but as observations continue to improve in, in the coming decades, more and more systems hopefully will become accessible. Yep. Question about that picture on the left. So the jet seems to be passing relatively close to other stars. Yeah, so I mean, this is so the question is the jet seems to be passing close to other stars. I mean, in this image, that's just a projection is the, the jet uh, and the stars are, are likely at very different distances. But the jet must go by, you know, not hit, but go by somewhat close to st some stars in this galaxy. That certainly is true. What you're seeing here is really just a projection. What does it do to those stars? It's a good question. Um, I think by the time it gets out to large distances, the energy per solid angle is actually not all that high. So my guess is it doesn't have huge effect, but that's an off-the-cuff thought. I don't, I, I haven't actually thought about that in detail. Interesting question. Yeah, the other thing that people worry about is, uh, you know, what if there were one of these black holes that was a trillion times brighter than a star in our own galaxy? You can see that's not the case, right? There's no booming bright source of light in this image. All you see actually is the stars, and that could have interesting effects on the Earth's atmosphere would be the brightest source of light in the sky other than the sun. Uh, but fortunately for us, at least right now, that's not the case. Okay, that's a, a little bit of, of context uh, and a little bit of 
sort of pedagogical background to understand where we are and why this is so exciting. And what I want to do is I want to sort of take you through the two cases of the center of our galaxy and the galaxy M87. So these examples and tell you a little bit about some of the science that we've learned from, from these uh, amazing observational breakthroughs. And I should say this is an incredibly rich science area. And so there's lots of different aspects of the science that one could emphasize. And obviously, I'm going to emphasize parts of the science that are closely related to things that I've been thinking about and that my group has been thinking. But I encourage you, if you have question, other questions, you know, I'm happy to chat. As I said, there are three other experts on this science here as well, so I'm sure they'd be happy to chat. The center of our galaxy, just to remind you, this is the system for which Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Ghez won the Nobel Prize in Physics for the demonstration of a massive dark object at the center of our galaxy uh, through this amazing program of watching the orbits of stars over 20 plus years as they orbit around the black hole at the center of the galaxy. And um, the gravity interferometer, one of the things that that has done is it has en enabled incredibly precise measurements of the orbits of the star as it goes around the black hole shown here, because you now can pinpoint where the star is to higher accuracy because you have higher angular resolution. So we know the mass of the black hole at the center of our galaxy to a level of precision that's extremely unusual for astronomy. We usually can't measure the masses of objects to, to very high precision. In this case, it's a sub-percent measurement directly from Keplerian dynamics. The stars are, are far enough away that to first approximation, you can use Keplerian dynamics. Uh, now, the Schwarzschild precession, the apsidal precession of the orbit, a la Mercury's apsidal precession, uh, that has also been detected for this particular. This takes account of dark matter. This, this does in the region where the stars are orbiting. There's a, a negligible amount of dark matter, and there's actually not even that much mass in stars. The mass in stars inside the orbit of this star is, if I remember correctly, it's like a thousand times smaller than the black hole mass. And you actually know that observationally, because if there were more mass in stars or dark matter, it would be spatially extended and it would cause a different precession of the orbit. So you can constrain that directly observationally. That's one of the nice things that comes out of this. Okay. The, the sort of remarkable thing about the center of our galaxy is despite the fact that it has a 4 million solar mass black hole, the amount of light produced by gas spiraling into the black hole at the center of our galaxy is actually extremely piddling. So if you take observations across all of the electromagnetic spectrum, from the highest energy gamma rays to the longest wavelength radio waves, the total accretion power, the total radiation that we get, we think, from close to the horizon of the black hole, from gas spiraling into the black hole, it's only about 100 times the luminosity of the sun. And that's why in this picture on the right, nothing jumps out as being where the black hole is, because lots of these stars are much, much brighter than 100 times the luminosity of the sun. So what you see when you look at the center of the galaxy is you just see all these stars, and it's really hard to know exactly uh, where the black hole is. It turns out it's sort of right there at the center of the image. Um, so the most of the radiation, this is a, a nice coincidence, most of the radiation produced by gas spiraling into the black hole at the center of our galaxy comes out in the millimeter part of the electromagnetic spectrum. That's the radio part of the electromagnetic spectrum, exactly where the Event Horizon Telescope can take these amazing, very high angular resolution images of, of what's happening at the center of the galaxy. And so this is the Event Horizon Telescope uh, image of the radio light from the center of the galaxy. So the, the color here just denotes how bright the source of light is. So the more saturated white regions are higher flux, higher intensity, and the dark regions are um, regions where there's less flux. The scale here is given in angle. 
the micro arc seconds. Uh, and then given the mass of the black hole and the distance to the center of the galaxy, the scale bar here is about 10 GM over C squared, or about five times perhaps the uh, event horizon of the black hole. Frequency distribution, the amplitude of frequency distribution is that determined simply by the spinning rate and the mass? Uh, you mean the frequency distribution of the radiation? So the question is what determines the frequency distribution of the radiation? Well, that's a lot of the, the kind of modeling that I do. That depends somewhat on the mass and the spin of the black hole. It depends a lot on how much gas is flowing in towards the black hole and the thermodynamics of that gas. So black body. it is uh, in this particular case, it is very non black body. There are other cases where it's closer to black body, but in this case, it's completely non black body. Is it understood why there's three lobes in the universe? <laughs> <laughs> Michael? <laughs> uh, I and actually, it would be better for Michael to answer that question because he, <laughs> he, I mean, my understanding is that this should not, that feature should not be viewed as being that statistically significant, so that there is evidence for probably some azimuthal variation in intensity, but exactly what form it takes um, depends on uh, details of the modeling of the data that are that are challenging. And part of the reason for that is that the center, center of our galaxy, the light varies quickly. How bright it is changes rapidly in time. And that really complicates how people like Michael analyze the data to infer images like that. Is that a fair? Okay, thank you. Um, so the, the other points here, this is the gravity observations of the infrared light from the center of the galaxy superimposed on the event horizon telescope image. And each of these points represent different times at which gravity has measured the position on the sky where the infrared light is coming from. And so what they see is that the position on the sky where the infrared light is coming from seems to be moving around. And in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases, it looks like what they're actually seeing is a region of light orbiting around the black hole on a spatial scale of something like 10 times the event horizon of the black hole. This is infrared part of the radio, uh, electromagnetic spectrum, radio part of the electromagnetic spectrum. This very faint source of light associated with the black hole at the center of our galaxy has been a puzzle for decades. In fact, this was viewed as such a problem that for many years, Andrea Ghez and Reinhard Genzel were told that they shouldn't be looking for a black hole at the center of the galaxy because it's obvious there can't be one because there isn't a bright source of light at the center of the galaxy associated with accretion onto the black hole. We now know that's not the right way to look at it. The right way to look at it is the other way around. There's definitely a 4 million solar mass black hole there. We have to understand why the amount of light produced by gas falling into the black hole is so faint. And just to give you a sense of kind of sharpening this puzzle, what you're seeing in this image, this is the central light year of the center of the galaxy, these are basically all stars, and the, the big bright sources of light are very, very massive stars. And very massive stars drive powerful winds, so they lose lots of mass. And so you can go into this image, like in, they draw a sphere here that's about a million times outside the event horizon of the black hole. And you can ask, how much gas are those stars dumping into their surroundings by winds? And the answer turns out to be roughly 10 to the minus three solar masses a year gas is being lost by the star. And the expectation is that actually a large fraction of this gas should be gravitationally captured by the black hole because the stars are actually orbiting around the black hole. A large fraction of the gas should be captured by the black hole. But if this amount of gas spiraled into the black hole, we would expect to see a source of light 
if the efficiency is 10% at converting mass into energy, we'd expect to see a source of light that is millions or tens of millions of times brighter than what we actually see. Another way to say that is that the observed luminosity relative to the amount of mass available from the stars is an efficiency of about 10 to the minus eight, which is absurdly small, that's more on the scale of chemical reactions, right, than it is of the most relativistic objects in the universe, black holes, were introduced into astronomy right, precisely to explain a very high efficiency of converting mass into So how do we understand this puzzle? You think this is related to the distinction that I made for you earlier about what is the fate of energy released as gas spirals into a black hole? Does it go into outflows? Does it go into radiation? Does it go into the black hole? Right. And in particular, we think that the black hole at the center of our galaxy and the black hole at the center of M87 are both in the regime where the cooling is relatively inefficient. So as the gas is spiraling into the black hole, it's being heated up. All this gravitational energy is being released, but the energy gets stored as heat in the matter and it doesn't get radiated away because the time for the gas to radiate away its thermal energy is very long. And so it's in this regime where the gravitational potential energy goes into heat which either goes through the horizon or goes into the form of outflows, but doesn't come out necessarily in the form of radiation because the ability of the gas to radiate is very inefficient. And this idea was really first developed in the mid 1970s uh, and then pushed forward uh, through uh, the decades since then, in particular, starting in the mid 1990s. And the basic prediction of that model is that if all this gravitational energy is going into heat, it's not being radiated away, then to order of magnitude at least, the average thermal energy per particle, Kt, could be about the gravitational potential energy of that piece of gas. Gravity is the energy source producing the heat. If you're not radiating the energy away, you don't have an energy loss mechanism. So you end up with a temperature that's comparable to the gravitational potential energy. And that predicts close to the black hole temperatures of 10 to the 11 or 10 to the 12 Kelvin. So temperatures of, you know, hundreds of MeV, tens of MeV. So very, very, very hot plasma, um, much hotter than at the center of the sun, for example. You might think that that, ga that hot gas should radiate very efficiently, uh, but part of the reason it doesn't is because the density is so low. And we think that this basic prediction has actually been verified by the observations of this radio emission from very close to the black hole. So I wanna just tell you a tiny bit more about what we can infer from these beautiful observations. So there's really two parts to the story of what this image tells us. One is related to sort of the existence of black holes and uh, the fact that there is a dark region at the center of the image. We think that's associated with the fact that as the gas, as it's spiraling into the black hole, gets closer and closer to the event horizon, uh, the radiation that it produces is more and more likely to get bent into the black hole rather than escaping to a distant observer. And it gets more and more redshifted, right, as it's leaving the vicinity of black hole going to a distant observer. And so the sort of dark region is indicative of the fact that the gas is falling onto an object that has an escape speed comparable to the speed of light that produces strong gravitational lensing, et cetera, sort of the predictions of a general relativity close to a black hole. So that's really a, an amazing confirmation that we very likely are seeing this 4 million solar masses all in a single object, a black hole at the center of the galaxy. But the other thing we can infer from this that is astrophysically at least as interesting 
is we can actually measure the physical properties of the plasma that's producing this radiation. I didn't say that yet, but this is actually synchrotron radiation. So radiation produced by relativistic electrons moving around magnetic field. And because we've measured the flux in the synchrotron radiation, the size of the region producing the synchrotron radiation, the frequency at which the radiation is coming out at, we can actually go from the observations to inferring the physical conditions in that plasma. And what one infers is magnetic field strengths of something like 30 Gauss, densities of a million particles per cubic centimeter, and temperatures of three or tens of MeV. And so those temperatures are in the ballpark uh, of the theoretical predictions that were made you know, 50 years ago of what the physical condition should be if the gas is indeed in this regime where it can't radiate away most of the gravitational potential energy that it gets. Both sides have magnetic fields, uh, six orders of magnitude higher. Yeah. Huh? And all this magnitude. Yeah. Do we understand why the magnetic field can be so low? So the question here is uh, neutron stars have magnetic fields up to 10 to the 12, 10 to the 15 Gauss, so much, much, much larger than this. Um, so in that sense, this seems like a small magnetic field. It's sort of similar to the Earth and the Sun. It's nothing, nothing particularly impressive. The energy in the magnetic field here is similar to the energy in the gas. So B squared is about NKT. And so we think that the energy stored in the magnetic field here is set by how much gas there is falling into the black hole. And that sort of dictates the characteristic value of the magnetic field strength that you get. So the other thing that one can infer from this is we've now measured the density of the plasma very close to the event horizon. Near the event horizon, the gas has to be moving at near the speed of light. You know, if you're just outside the event horizon, you're going in at roughly the speed of light. And so you can take this density and multiply by a speed, the speed of light, multiply by a surface area of the event horizon, and infer how much gas is flowing in towards the black hole every second. And it turns out to be an inflow rate of gas, which is roughly 10 to the minus eight solar masses per year. These are all given as twiddles. You should think of these as estimates that have, you know, factor of three or four uncertainties. Uh, there are details of the modeling that make it hard at this point to do much better than that. But it's still nonetheless an amazing inference that we know, you know, within a few times the event horizon of the black hole, we're able to measure density, temperature, magnetic field strength, inflow rate um, using these, these observations. And given this inflow rate, the luminosity accretion power, how much energy is radiated away by gas falling into the black hole, is about 10 to the minus 3 m dot c squared. So that's consistent with this idea most of the energy is actually not coming out as radiation. Most of the energy liberated by accretion is either going through the event horizon or being driven out in the form of out. So the mass accretion rate is much lower than the 10 minus 3 solar masses per year that you estimated were available. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> Ilya is saying, okay, maybe you feel like you've solved the problem because you know this is at least better than a chemical reaction. It's not this ridiculous 10 to the minus eight number, but in some sense, we've just created a new problem, which is I told you there's this huge source of mass available to accrete onto the black hole. Where does it go? Why doesn't it end up going into the black hole? So that's something that we've been really trying to understand. So what we've done to understand this is we've basically done numerical models where we start from Andrea Gez and Reinhard Genzel's observations far away from the black hole, that tell us how the stars are orbiting around the black hole. We know the mass loss rates, the winds from those stars, how much mass each of these stars is sending out into its surroundings. And so we simulate this numerically and we follow the gas then from a spatial scale where the stars are observed a million times outside the horizon. We follow the gas all the way down to the horizon. 
this is sort of a 3D volume rendering uh, of the density of the gas, um, which I actually find artistically interesting, but not scientifically very useful movie. Um, so when you say there's an observational input on M dot wind, you mean someone has actually measured a wind density from those stars? These are the these are these are the wolf winds from massive stars. No, these are actually from infrared spectroscopy of the wolf ray stars at the center of the galaxy. So these are also uncertain after a few pumping usual stuff, but exactly. So they actually have for each of the stars there's spectroscopy, and so we have measured mass loss. Sorry, for the stars that produce strong winds, we have that. There are many of the stars that don't produce strong winds, and we would only have an upper limit. Here's our local region in the galaxy. How many more stars per unit volume are there near the planet? Right. So the, the number of stars per unit volume um, is something like uh, tens of thousands of times larger. And we haven't even seen the faint stars yet, so it's probably more than that because we haven't seen all the faint stars. So then we take this calculation. This is a Newtonian calculation far from the black hole. Uh, we take that and we use that as input into a general relativistic simulation, which takes the Kerr space time and solves the dynamics of fluids orbiting around, spiraling into black holes. Uh, now, starting from initial conditions given by these orbiting stars far away from the black hole. So we zoom in from a million times the horizon all the way to the horizon um, through you know, starting from sort of observationally well-motivated conditions far away from the black hole. That's the, that's the method. And this calculation allows us to predict what is the accretion rate close to the event horizon, how bright should the accretion flow be in terms of radio flux, what should the image look like, and the thing that I find amazing, given the difficulty of this calculation, needing to span a million in radial dynamic range, you know, stuff moving at the speed of light, lots of interesting and complex physics, is that when we do this, what we find is that indeed the vast majority of the mass produced by these stellar winds doesn't go into the black hole. It's driven away uh, by outflows. And only a tiny fraction of the gas actually ends up going through the horizon. This is accretion rate versus distance. There's actually a self-similar solution where the accretion rate is a power law in radius that declines as you go to smaller and smaller radii. More and more mass gets blown away. And you end up with an accretion rate in these numerical models near the horizon that's uh, about 10 to minus 8 solar masses a year, similar to what is observationally inferred. We also have in these calculations, we have relativistic electrons and magnetic fields. And so we can produce the synchrotron flux. These are four different models. You know, there's a few uncertain parameters. We don't know the spin of the black hole. We don't know exactly what the magnetic field is far from the black hole. So we tried out different versions of those parameters. A gray band here is the observed range of radio flux from the center of the Milky Way. These curves are the theoretical prediction. Uh, my observer colleagues sometimes complain that, you know, the theoretical model doesn't exactly agree with the observations. It's a little too bright sometimes and a little too faint sometimes. I actually view this as sort of an amazing uh, theoretical result, given, again, that what we're doing is with basically no free parameters, starting a million times away from the black hole and following what happens all the way down to the event horizon. That we did start with virtually no free parameters here. Um, what would have to change in order to have more efficient accretion onto the black hole? So are you saying that winds will never do it? I think in in right. So the question is, this is sort of generically. If you have these few orbiting stars, you end up with this very low gas making it down. Um, how do you get the big bright sources? And I think the answer is you need another gas supply to come in, molecular cloud to fall in or something to fall in that produces a much denser environment at the center of the galaxy. 
Okay. Let's skip some interesting stuff, non-equilibrium. Okay. All right. So the the last thing I want to mention is just some recent work that we've been doing that I'm particularly excited about, which is uh, connecting the observations of M87 by the Event Horizon Telescope to the possibility of measuring spin energy extraction from black hole. And this is work led by Andrew Chael, Alex Lupsoska here, uh, and George Wong. Andrew and George are both postdocs in Princeton. Uh, we've been having a, a tremendous amount of fun with this, this work. So the idea again is back to this question. What is the energy source for these outflows, these jets that seem to be powered by big black holes at the centers of galaxies or even you know, little black holes uh, in our own galaxy? Is it the energy liberated by accretion of gas onto the black hole? Or is it actually the rotational energy of the black hole? And that tapping into the spin energy of the black hole, we call the Blanford's Nyack process in honor of Roger Blanford and Roman Znayak who worked this out in 1977. Um, sort of a nice visualization of this process is here by, by George. If you have a spinning black hole and you have magnetic field lines threading the event horizon, then the rotation of the black hole twists up the magnetic field lines that are in the vicinity of the black hole. And that rotation or twist in the magnetic field lines drives a pointing flux out uh, along the magnetic field, whose ultimate energy source is the rotational energy of the black hole. You are spinning down the black hole, its rotational energy is decreasing, and that energy is going out into pointing flux along the magnetic field. You can see here in the visualization that you're even close to the black hole, you're starting to get this somewhat collimated structure, is related to the earlier question about why is it collimated as opposed to overall solid energy. You know, the currents making the, the currents making the, the magnetic field are, are not in the black hole, they're in the plasma outside the black hole. So this happens if there is enough plasma outside the black hole uh, to sustain currents that can do this. That turns out to be pretty easy to do. It doesn't take much plasma to generate enough currents to do this. Yes, that's that's an important important point. Oh. What's the typical size of the opening angle for the jet? Just for a ballpark figure. Yeah, so I would say we know that observationally, it is you know ten degrees or something like that. As the question was, the opening angle. Of... Oh, the the basic argument in the work uh, that Andrew uh, and Alex in particular have led is that the Event Horizon Telescope, into, in addition to telling us how bright the synchrotron radiation is close to the event horizon, it also tells us the polarization of the synchrotron. So this is actually the observations. Each tick mark is the local electric field associated with the radiation. And in synchrotron radiation in flat space time, the magnetic field in the region producing the synchrotron radiation is orthogonal to the direction of polarization. The light is polarized at 90 degrees relative to the local magnetic field. So the way you should think about this image is that if it were flat space time, and if there were no effects of plasma along the line of sight, Faraday rotation, don't worry about that, but I'm happy to answer questions about it. Then what you could do is you could go from the measurement of the polarization of the synchrotron radiation to the local direction of the magnetic field. Now, radiative transfer, parallel transport in general relativity modifies that a little bit without uh, not to be a, a particularly large effect in this case, in part because uh, we're viewing the system, we think, relatively close to face on, meaning the spin axis of the, of the jet is along or uh, either parallel or anti-parallel to our line of sight. We actually think it's anti-parallel to our line of sight. So the basic argument 
that we've realized just in the last six months or so is that the way to test for spin energy extraction of black holes is to measure this rotation, this helical structure in the magnetic field uh, due to the winding up of the magnetic field by the rotation of the black hole. And that that information is actually directly encoded in the spiraling pattern of the polarization seen on the scale of the event. Because this spiraling pattern associated with the polarization tells you basically the spiraling or helicity of the magnetic field, 90 degree phase shift roughly. And that allows you to infer whether the rotation of the magnetic field lines that's observed is or is not consistent with pointing flux flowing out along these magnetic field lines. And the basic inference from the observations, and I'm happy, or I'm sure Alex is happy to talk to people about this in more detail if you have questions, that these observations taken by the Event Horizon Telescope are consistent uh, with an outgoing pointing flux on a scale that's about five times the horizon of the black hole, which is the scale of the end. So that's sort of direct evidence for an outgoing pointing flux on a scale of about five times the horizon. Uh, it doesn't definitively tell us that that energy flux is coming from spin energy of the black hole, because it could still be coming from the energy liberated by gas accreting onto the black hole, the accretion energy released as gas spirals into the black hole. So the way to distinguish those possibilities even more is as the observations improve and we can look closer and closer to the region around the event horizon near the center of this image, we'll see gas closer and closer to the event horizon. We'll see gas that's more and more likely to be on magnetic fields that are actually going through the horizon. And thus we'll be able to infer whether or not this energy flow is coming from accretion or from the spin energy of the black. Question? Uh, looking at this picture, it seems that uh, it's uh, unorientable. Uh, I mean, if you follow the, uh, the picture, you can distinguish the, the opposite of energy. And how is this consistent with uh, uh, the magnetic field because the magnetic field is the vector. So we're looking at the, in this case, the magnetic field we think is mostly in the plane of this image, mostly in the plane of this image. And so we're seeing in the plane of that image, we're then seeing some other vector, which is the polarization vector, which is orthogonal to the local magnetic field. Right, but uh, I'm uh, looking at this picture. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. But if I go around this picture, yes, you know, uh, I think uh, the perpendicular vector is in this picture. That's right. You know, there's, there's the, uh, what you would infer, the what you would infer is mostly radial magnetic field lines. Yeah. Would be mostly so that the magnetic field lines that are going like this or like this, such that the magnetic field is then perpendicular to the, the electric field or the electric field tick shown there. Yeah, so right here, good. So right here, it's not so clear. I completely agree. This is actually the region, but this image doesn't show you is the magnitude of the polarization. This is the least polarized part of the image. So the polarization fraction is the smallest. And I think it's fair to say that uh, this region, um, you know, something else might be going on. I'm not, a, we're not hundred percent sure. We think it's actually probably affects the Faraday rotation, which I can explain uh, if people have more questions. Does that, does that help? Yeah. This picture reminds me of the Cohen Fimo's thing. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything else? Yeah, so great question. So our little working group spent yesterday afternoon with uh, Michael Johnson telling us about how one can decompose 
this polarization field into E and B modes, just like is done in the CMB. And so we can analyze this data in a similar way. And that's Michael and a, and a wonderful graduate student actually made this figure for me, Daniel Palumbo uh, at, at Harvard have recently been doing exactly that. So there is a, a good analogy there. Question. So the, the last thing I'll, I'll mention here uh, is that in principle, there's also information about black hole spin in this elicity of the polarization. Because if you just think through the sort of chain of reasoning I gave you, right, how the how much the magnetic field gets wrapped up will depend on how fast the black hole is rotating. Black hole is rotating very quickly. You wrap up the magnetic field dramatically, producing a primarily as a muthal magnetic field, which would produce polarization ticks that look like this. If the black hole is rotating more slowly, then you less effectively wrap up the uh, spin up, sorry, um, wrap up the magnetic field. And so you end up with a magnetic field that is slightly more radial. And so polarization ticks are more azimuth. And we're, there's a variety of reasons why we're not making any particularly strong claims. There's still systematic uh, effects in trying to go from models of this to the observations. But if you just compare the observations, these are theoretical models that George Wong put on the same color bar, right, to look similar to the, to the observational image that Daniel Palumbo made. You know, the observations look more like the left two than they look like the right one, which would suggest a relatively lower spin for the black hole in M87. So one of the things we're really hoping to do is to understand better the systematic uncertainty in this in this argument, and so really be able to push this argument to the point where we can make uh, quantitatively stronger statements about spin than here. Is there a orientation dependence of this question? What do you mean by orientation dependence? Presumably, this is, uh, this is observed from a certain direction. Yeah, good question. So I question is, is there an observing angle dependence to this? And I, I glossed over that. So. We think in the case of M87, the black hole spin is pointed away from us. And that is actually defining the coordinate system that's being used here. And you're absolutely right. If you were viewing the system from a different perspective, you would observe a, a different handedness of the tip. So, uh, this is magneto has been managed to say that they just, I think, the smallest. So, so this is a toy analytic model, um, but the, in the simulations that we do using techniques that Charles Gammy originally developed, um, you get jets that uh, appear to be actually relatively stable. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, the, the way astronomers would describe the magnetic field associated with this would be what we call split monopole, where in one hemisphere you have sort of one direction of magnetic field, in the other you have an opposite direction. So there's no, you're not violating the div B equals zero constraint. That's how, I mean, maybe that gets through. I'm not sure what singularity you're talking about. Okay, so I'll, I'll end there and I'll just say that you know, I think we're really just scratching the surface of what we can do with this kind of science as the observations improve and we have better observations from the ground or even from space. Um, it will allow us to see fainter features. It'll allow us to see closer to the projected location of the event horizon in the image. And it'll, it'll allow us to basically take all of the arguments that I've given you here which are still, I would say, at the semi-quantitative level, it'll allow us to take those arguments and really make them quantitatively much sharper and enable really definitive tests of things like spin energy extraction of uh, rotational energy from black holes, precise measurements of exactly what the density, temperature, et cetera, are close to the horizon. Okay, so thanks, I'm out of time, I'll stop there.
to change their mind to any great job, given that there were a lot of interruptions with questions and it's already four o'clock, I think we should soon head over to the uh, cheese and wine, which I think are being served outside, but maybe we have time for just one or two questions. Well, yeah. So your, you know, I think you called the toy model of the, of the polarization is more consistent with the low spin. There were constraints placed on the spin from the EHD collaboration, which were based, I think, on energetics. Can you compare and comment? Right. Uh, that's right. So I should say the exact same argument, um, exact same argument favoring low spin uh, is actually in the GRMHD simulations that were used to analyze the observations in in the, some of the original EHT papers. I think what, what we've done is have sort of an analytic, under, a better analytic understanding of why that argument applies. Um, and I think a spin of a third or a half is still completely fine with the energetics of the jet in M87. There's, you know, there's no indication that we need a very rapidly spinning black hole to produce the, the jets that we see. Uh, there's lots of lots of available energy, even if the spin is at the lower end. Yeah, good question. Last question. Uh, is, is there a location of a black hole or a situation uh, that would allow you to say something about uh, dark matter, properties of dark matter from energy that is created on a black hole? But the question is, is, is there any scenario in which one might be able to say something about the properties of dark matter from black holes? Um, I, not that I know of off the top of my head. Um, you know, if people have other thoughts, we can chat about it afterwards. You know, I think certainly for the astrophysically studied black holes through gravitational waves or through observations like this. There's so little dark matter in the vicinity of the black hole that it has completely negligible effect on anything that we can hope to measure or infer. I know there were other questions, so apologies to those with more questions, but I, I, I think I'll be here on the plane you so you can ask them then. And thanks again, everyone. Uh, 